Hey, North Coast, thanks for joining us for today's message. We're continuing in our series here in David, but before we do that, I have a couple things I wanted to share with you. First, summer events are in full swing. In fact, we've got one specifically for you. July 21st, we have an event called North Coast Offline. It's an opportunity for those in our online community to connect better with our staff. What does that look like? Well, one thing I can share with you, our worship pastor is interviewing Chris Brown. It's gonna be fun. There's a lot of other things planned. Sign up online, or you can text a keyword offline to the number on the screen, and we'll get you more information. Now, let's get ready for today's message. You can download the message notes, you can complete a connection card, or even give online at our website, northcoastchurch.com, or in our app. Now, let's get ready for worship and a message from Pastor Larry Osborne. Enjoy. Your love is for me. Surrendered in upon a tree You made my soul to see To tell the story of our King Pour out Pour out my praise with every breath Give you my all Nothing less, not just a part of me. I give up everything, pour out my praise with every breath. Give you my all, and nothing less, not just a part of me. I give up everything. i 
Hey, I've got a question for you. Have you ever been devastated by someone that you looked up to as a spiritual giant? You kind of thought they had a corner on the spirit of God and they had it all together and they did something that caused you to go, how in the world could they do that? My bet is many of us, when we look back in the rearview mirror of our own life, have situations where you wonder, how could I have done that? Well, today's passage answers that question. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and it's a story, the infamous story of David and Bathsheba. And as we look at it today, we're going to discover how a man who was after God's own heart, who was incredibly blessed in everything that he did, who's the author of many of the Psalms that we love in our Bible, did such a wicked thing, it's, it's, just, it's, it's hard to believe or imagine how in the world this person could do that Uh, dastardly deed. And sadly, the event we're going to look at today is what is, in my mind, David's Waterloo. From this point on, nothing is ever really the same. He is going to be forgiven, uh, and and God is not going to take the crown away from him. He's not going to die as as he should have died for what he did. But really, from this point on, everything has a gray cloud over it. Uh, there's uh, just a, a, a sad sense of tarnishing for every blessing that we're going to read in the rest of his life. Now, he's got an eternity where he's been experiencing his forgiveness, and God does some incredibly great things. But again, this is his Waterloo. And so we want to look at it, and we want to figure out how in the world he came to that place. And before we do, I want to remind you of something we've been saying over and over again, and that is when it comes to the David story, God is the hero of the story. He's the one who draws straight lines with crooked sticks, even as crooked as we're going to discover David is. He's the one who provides unimaginable grace and mercy far beyond anything that we would offer. And he's the one who keeps all of his promises, even when we cannot keep our own. So if you got a note sheet uh, uh, with you, be ready. And I hope you've got your Bible or digital device all ready to mark up because what we're going to see here as we walk through 2 Samuel chapter 11, what I call David's Waterloo, is we're going to see how a guy goes from hero to zero in seven short and quick steps. So let's dig into it right now, okay? 
2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab. Step number one. In the spring, when kings are supposed to go off to war and be with their troops, David doesn't go off to war. He sends Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. And they destroy the Amorites and besiege Rahab. But David remained in Jerusalem. So in this very first uh, verse, the author twice wants us to understand fully that David is neglecting his responsibility. And it all starts, this downward hill uh, uh, path starts with the first step of taking privilege that really was not his privilege to take. It's the curse of success. We've been seeing over and over how God has been blessing him and uh, how everything he's been touching now that he has uh, been king has made him more and more powerful. And so he decides when kings should go off to war that that applies to every other king, but that, David decides, doesn't apply to him. Now we pick it up in verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. And from the roof, number two, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. So the second thing is he's looking around. He's got a temptation right in front of him. He's got a glance, which is going to turn into step number three, into a gaze. And we're going to see what happens with that. So verse three, and David sent someone to find out about her. So he's not taking his responsibility. He's now walking around and through no wrong of his own, except for he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. He sees a beautiful woman going through her ceremonial bathing after her cycle has ended. And then he lets his gaze, uh, excuse me, his glance turn into a gaze. And from this point on, it's all downhill. Third thing he does is he sends someone to find out about her, according to verse 3. And the man who he sent comes back and says, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now I want us to understand what he was just told. He was just told this woman is totally, absolutely off limits. He's clearly told that she is the daughter of Elam. Who is Elam? Well, it's one of David's mighty warriors. She's also the granddaughter of Ahithophel. Who is that? Well, that's one of David's chief counselors. And on top of that, number three, she is the wife of one of his mighty warriors who's out at battle at this very time named Uriah. Well, step number four, what's he do? He doesn't go, oh, wow, thank you. I did not know that. No. Verse four, David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him. And step number five, he slept with her. Now, she'd been purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness, we're told. And then she went back home. Now, theoretically, she shouldn't be able to get pregnant at this time. It reminds me of the old uh, saying, you know, what do you call people who use the rhythm method? You call them parents. And David, at this point, would have figured out that, well, hey, there's not really here a problem for me. Um, But indeed, there was. So she went back home. And the woman conceived, and she sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And now we have step number six. Circle in your Bible this key word. So when he hears the bad news, what does David do? So he decides to hatch a clever plan to cover it up. So David sent this word to Joab, his general out in the battle, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And he comes up with this wonderful plan. Verse 7, when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going, a bunch of goofy small talk. And then David said to Uriah, well, you know what? Thanks for the information. Now you go down to your house and you wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift for the king was sent. You know, one of those little packages of champagne and, and crackers and cheese and all that kind of stuff. He's just trying to make it as romantic a night as possible. But verse 9 throws a curve into the whole story. Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants and didn't go down to his house. Well, when David was told about this, that David, uh, Uriah didn't go down to his house, he, he the next day asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why, why don't you just go home? And Uriah said to David, hey, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant and Israel and Judah, they are all staying in tents. 
And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are all camped in the open country. By the way, David, where you should be as well. How can I go down to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you leave, king, I will not do such a thing. And then David has to go to plan B. So David sends for him and he says, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will uh, uh, send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and, and at David's invitation, he ain't ate and drank with him, which we saw last weekend was a really big deal to be able to eat at the king's table. And you might underline this phrase, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He didn't go home. So David's now stuck. He's got this plan. Things, uh, uh, his whole cover-up thing, which he thinks is all safe, is all blown to pieces by the integrity of Uriah as he's trying to cover up his lack of integrity. And now we come to the seventh step. Verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, the general, and he sent it with Uriah. And in it, he wrote these words. Put Uriah out in front of the fighting where it's fiercest and then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. In David's twisted mind, I'm betting that at this point he's gone so far down that he's figuring out he's got nothing else to do and it's really Uriah's problem because he wouldn't go in and sleep with her and even if he got him drunk and sent all the party goods and all that, he wouldn't sleep with her. So Uriah, this is what you've brought on yourself. So while... Joab had the city under siege, verse 16 tells us. He put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men of the David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Now catch this. Not just Uriah died, but other valiant, good and godly soldiers died in David's plan. Well, in verse 18, Joab decides to send David a full account of the battle, but he knows that, that David might fly off the handle when he hears kind of what the strategy was and the, that these soldiers had died. So he instructs a messenger in verse 19 with these words, when you finish giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know there would, they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobesheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall when they got so close so that he died? Why, why did he get so close to the wall? What in the world is Joab thinking? And Joab says, now listen, if he asks you this, then you just say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Well, the messenger sat out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. And in verse 23, the messenger says to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gates. And then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David tells the messenger, Will you say to Joab, Joab don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. And now in the last sentence of this chapter, God shows up. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Now, next weekend, we're going to see how much it displeased the Lord and what the consequences are, uh, are going to be and David's incredible response to it, where he finally at least turns a corner uh, in, in a little bit. But here's what we want to do today. There's so much in this famous story we could look at. Infamous story is a better way to put it. But what I want us to look at, and I, I've, I've kind of walked you through the seven steps we saw, I want us to step back and see the principles that help us understand how in the world the mighty fall. And there are, are, are four kind of principles that you and I can, can take to the bank when it comes to the situations where we find ourselves doing something we could have never imagined we would do. Or can help us understand when we look at someone else then when we're figuring out how in the world could they have done that. So let's take a look at how the mighty fall. Four key principles. 
Number one, it starts with an attitude of invincibility and power. There's, there's something about that attitude that David had that said, you know, it's spring. And even though I've got all these uh, great victories and essentially all we're doing is little mop-up jobs and, and enforcing our control in these areas, you know, I have earned for myself the privilege of not doing what kings are supposed to do. I'm going to send others out to the battle and I'm just going to stay back here and I'm going to relax. You know, Satan, the great liar, loves to whisper into not only David's ear, but your ear and my ear. The simple phrase, you're different. The cautions and the rules that apply to all the common folks, you know, they just don't apply to you. And he doesn't care whether he's using a situation where we're, we're in deep weeds and we're filled with fear or like David, where everything is going wonderfully and we're so filled with success. He will whisper the same thing. You were different. A slight little twist with each one. You see, when, when fear is what we're facing, when we're stuck into a situation and we don't really see how God's way uh, will work out in the short term, here's what he does. He goes, your situation is different. And how many times have we thought that? Oh, I know this is what you normally do. I know this is what everybody else would do. I can't tell you how many times I've showed Bible verses to people about things and say, this is what God says. And they will look back at me and go, yeah, but my situation is different. As if the rule or the command that God put in Scripture has a little asterisk by it, and you look down at the bottom, and there in the footnote it says, applies to everybody but Larry Osborne. Applies to everybody but, and then fill in your name. It, that's not how it works, I'm sorry. And it's this attitude of, 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 of privilege along with this invincibility, like, well, I'm not only privileged, I'm, I'm special. I'm not going to get burnt where everybody gets burnt that will cause us to do the wrong thing. In the Bible, there's a story, it's in your notes sheet, you can read it later this week, about a guy named Joash. It's in 2 Kings chapter 12. He's a king, and he's done a lot of right things, but suddenly a very powerful king has come against him, and, and he doesn't know how to buy off this king, and the only thing he can think of is not to trust God, but this is so dire a situation, my situation is different. He goes into the temple treasury, and he takes things that are devoted for, to God, and he buys off the enemy, and he thinks he's won the situation. Well, as you read on that story, he's done anything but that and everything else goes wrong. But it's not just fear, and it's not just when we're in deep weeds and we're going, wow, my situation is so different, I don't see a path to do the right thing and have it work out. It's also when we've been incredibly blessed that Satan whispers, not your situation is different, but you are different. It's what David did. There's another story in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Again, you can read it on your own uh, this week. It's a story of another king who thought that way. His name is Uzziah. And next to Solomon, he was the most powerful, successful king of all of Israel's kings, more so than David was. You read the beginning of 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and you're going, why have I not known more about this dude? His uh, uh, borders were expanded. His wealth was incredible. Uh, the, the weapons he was able to produce for his army were beyond anything else that anybody had. And then it says this, but when he became strong, he decided to go into the temple and make a special sacrifice. Here was a problem, and he knew it full well. Kings were allowed to do one thing, and the priests were allowed to do another. And the two were not to mix. The only king priest there was to ever be is our Lord Jesus Christ. But Uzziah said, you know, I'm just so different. And with a heart of wanting to give thanks to God, his heart was actually good. He decided, I'm going to give thanks to God in a way that no one else is allowed to. But I have been so blessed. God and I were like this. I'm sure it's okay. And the end of the chapter tells you why you never hear of him. He died a leper. All of this great stuff, gone in a moment. Because he decided, I am different. You see, it's a very short step from I am special to I am invincible, that nothing will touch me. And that usually means I think I can play with fire that burns others, and I won't even get singed. Now, I want to get real practical with this. I'm going to move from preaching to meddling in just a moment, but I need to, I, I need to make this pretty clear. And that is, not all privileges are wrong. 
you know, a few of us are born with a guilt gene where any time a privilege comes along, we feel like, oh, I shouldn't take that advantage of that situation. Or we judge other people who take advantage. Uh, some privileges are necessary and granted, which is very different than unnecessary and taken. You see, David's was not necessary and David's was taken. But there's a reason the quarterback wears a red jersey. There's a reason the president takes a private jet and doesn't fly in coach. There's a reason the star of the team makes more money than others. And those are privileges that are given and necessary, not unnecessary and taken. They're not approved by anybody else, but nobody else knows how to step in and stop us from doing it. So how does this attitude of self-appointed privilege uh, that's always dangerous, how does, how does it show up? Well, as we've seen, for David, he thought he'd earned the right not to do what every king was supposed to do. But I was thinking this week, what are some examples of our own self-appointed privileges? So I'm going to probably step on a few toes here. That's on purpose. And before you send the email back saying, well, what about this or whatever, just consider what I have to say and, and see if it's not a little bit of in springtime when all the kings go to war that you and I aren't deciding, well, I think I'll just stay back at the palace. Here we go. Three examples. Number one, when we think, what's the harm in ignoring the dumb rules for others who aren't as careful and as skilled as I am? Oh, I know that's a rule there, but it's for others who aren't as cautious, aren't as skilled as I am. I can handle it. Like, you know that national park sign that says, don't go beyond this barrier? Yeah, but I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to trip. Uh, I, I, I'm more careful. Uh, I'll get a better picture. Or how about that no left turn sign that doesn't really mean no left hand turn, especially when I'm in a hurry and I don't want to go up two signals before I have to make a U-turn. You know, it wasn't that long ago on a street right near me that uh, a guy was killed, a motorcyclist was killed by a guy making a left-hand turn out of an area where it was forbidden. The little sign was there. He had made it time after time after time, and this time he didn't see the person. And there was a reason that sign was there. And there's a reason that gentleman is in jail today because of what he did. Or how about that handicap parking sign when there's nothing else and I'm in a real hurry? Or how about seatbelts and texting? You know, I, 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 I know how to multitask pretty well, and I, I've got this thing all figured out. And you see, we just live in this zone where we often think these rules are kind of corny or don't make sense for me, and, and we go break them. And we have no idea the model we're setting for our children, what model we're setting for others, or the fact that maybe there's actually a reason why that rule is there. We think, what's the harm in ignoring this stupid rule for others who aren't as careful or as skilled as I am. Second, what about the small lies we justify to save a few bucks and we call this stewardship and wisdom? You know, hey, tell them you're 11, not 12. Um, how about with COVID? I wonder how many of us decided, you know what, there's this financial reward if all I got to do is be able to, to say that I've got some financial hardship when I don't necessarily really have it right now and, and all kinds of different things where, well, I just kind of twist it a little bit and everybody else is doing it, so why don't I do it? You see that rule about your yes being yes and telling the truth and speaking the truth always, it applies in most situations, but not in this one. Or third, how about the entertainment we consume? Entertainment that many of us would never watch when our mom was over or if Jesus was over. Here's the thing I want to remind you. Your mom might not be over, but Jesus is. <laughs> it's not like, oh, he's off busy or somewhere else. I, I love to ask a question on, in this day and age of entertainment where so much of it is so raw and not just in sexual areas, but other areas that ask the question, Am I going to invite Jesus over to say, hey, let's sit on the couch and watch this? Am I going to invite Jesus over and say, hey, let's sit down and let's, let's look through this. Let's fill in the blank. 
You see, none of us are kings where we decide, wow, when kings go out to war, I'm going to stay home. But all of us are people who decide, you know, those dumb rules, I'm not sure they really apply to me because I'm just more cautious or careful. And that small little lie, you know, like, why not? It's good stewardship. It's good wisdom. Or that bit of entertainment, oh, it's not going to callous my soul. It's not going to impact me. I'm different. And sadly, here's what we've done. We started the path of invincibility and privilege. And we don't even have any idea that Satan's already set us up. Now, here's the second thing. The second thing to understand about how the mighty fall is that we've lost the battle the moment we decide to resist instead of run. We've lost the battle the moment we decide to resist instead of run. You see, the Bible is quite clear that when it comes to the internal uh, desires of our heart, that we're supposed to run from them. But we get it backwards. The Bible also talks about resisting hardships. And, and, and so when hardships come in, we want to run. And, and when temptation comes, we want to resist. And in both cases, when you run from hardship, you're not going to find the strength the Lord has, has for you or the lessons he has to learn in it. And when I try to resist the internal things, as we're going to see, I'm doomed to fail uh, because I'm not wired that way. Now, I want to be crystal clear about this. It's not a sin to be tempted. A lot of us think that to have a thought or to have a desire to do something wrong or to look at it and wonder for a second, what am I going to do that, oh, well, I, I have somehow already uh, done wrong. No, it's not a temptation if you have no desire to do it, okay? It's not a temptation if you have no desire to do it. And temptation is not a sin, and I can prove it because Jesus was tempted. I want you to see what the book of Hebrews says about this. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted, guess what, in every way just as we are, and yet he did not sin, okay? This is incredibly important to grasp. Uh, uh, Jesus' temptation uh, was, was not fake. Uh, he was tempted in the sense of really desiring. Uh, like one example is he desired not to go to the cross. That's why he cr prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, is there any other way? Uh, he was tempted when the enemy met him uh, uh, in the wilderness. There's actually a desire or there is no temptation. And he wasn't just tempted in a couple of things. I want you to catch that he was tempted in every single way is what it says, just like we are. And yet, the fact that he had desires, things were put in front of him, and he was tempted did not mean that he was sinning in that temptation. His, his response every time was righteous. So the temptation itself is not the sin, and that's incredibly important to understand if we're going to have victory. You see, David was not doomed the moment he saw Bathsheba. He was doomed the moment he fed his temptation. When his glance turned into a gaze, which turned into go out and find out who in the world that person is, that was the moment that he ignited the fire of his sexual fantasies, which at that point seemed like nothing more than a little brush fire and ended up roaring completely out of control and destroying, just destroying immeasurable amount of people and things in his life. Now, here's the thing about how temptation works. There is no way zero way that David woke up that morning with any conceivability, any way he could have imagined that by the end of the day, he would have violated the wife of one of his valiant men. And in the end of a few weeks, he would have actually had that guy killed. Like if you told him that in the morning, you go, you're crazy. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. But he started down the path of the fool, and he paid the price. And that leads to something very, very important about why we need to run and not try to resist. And this may surprise you, but when you read through the Bible, 
uh, there's an incredibly important principle, and that is this, that most moral failure is not the sin of the wicked, it's the sin of the fool. Let me give that to you again. Most moral failure is not the sin of the wicked, it's the sin of the fool. Now, it can become the sin of the wicked when it just takes over our life, and, and, and that's what we become all about. Yeah, that's wickedness. But how does it start? It doesn't start because somebody wakes up one day and goes, ah, I'm wicked. No, it starts because they decide that they can go down a path, and they're special, and they're different, and they're going to be able to resist what others can't resist. You know, you look around, you know, most affairs begin with uh, innocent flirtation. Most embezzlement begins with, I'm going to borrow a few bucks, but I'll pay it back later. Uh, Most sense of uh, any of these things uh, begin with going down a path we go, ah, I know how to handle this. You know, Solomon, David's son, who wrote the incredibly wise book of Proverbs with its Proverbs about how life generally works, uh, in chapter 7 talks about uh, the path of the fool. And I want to read you just parts of it. You might want to read it all on your own this this week. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 6 to 27. Solomon makes this observation. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice work. And here's what I saw. I saw the simple, we would use the word naive today, I noticed among the young men a youth who had absolutely no sense. So what's this guy do? Well, it says he was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. As the passage goes on, he's not looking for trouble. He's just taking a shortcut. He's just assuming like it's really okay at this time of the day for me to walk down there and move uh, in that direction. He was walking along the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. And then the passage goes on, and he's challenged with a temptation. And here's how it ends, verse 22. All at once. Catch that. All at once. He follows her. How? He gives three examples. Like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing that it will cost him his life. You know, the ox does not know that suddenly the throat is going to be slit. And, and uh, the deer that's walking along and, and is caught in the trap, it's like one step before, life is great. And then suddenly, what is this? And next thing you know, boom, the arrow and, and, uh, and, and dinner for the next few months is, is being served. It's the same with a bird that darts into a snare or a trap. Moments before, no idea it's going to cost him his life. And, and that was David, as I said that morning. And that's why I'm pleading to you to understand this principle in your life and my life that we don't see it coming. And when we think that we can do what others can't do because we're stronger than others, more blessed than others, fill in the blank, more committed to God than others, pray better than others, we're taking the path not of wickedness, we'll do wickedness, but we're taking the path of a fool. You see, the truth is, ever since Adam and Eve, all of us have been born with a voracious appetite. Every son and daughter of Adam, every son and daughter of Eve is born with a voracious appetite for sweet tasting poison. It looks so good. It smells so good. It tastes so good. Greed, sexual lust, destructive pleasures, Pride, winning at all cost, all of those things that come from inside as temptations. They're sweet tasting poison. Make no mistake. A couple of things you might want to jot down. Make no mistake. Number one, the pleasures of sin are indeed incredibly pleasurable. You know, one of the mistakes sometimes we make uh, in Sunday school classes or, or with our children or whatever, we will paint sin as if the experience of sin is horrible. No, the long-term consequences of sin are horrible. But the short-term delights of sin, <laughs> that's why we do it. They're incredibly pr- pleasurable. I mean, I've written down some specifics here. Sex outside of marriage. Hey, it can be the sex, best sex you've ever had in your life. 
Stolen money can buy some incredibly amazing things. Slandering and gossiping about an enemy, oh man, that can feel really good and can build you up and can actually tear them down. And if you want to be incredibly selfish, watching out for yourself, making sure that you're always getting the big piece, there's a likelihood you will get the big piece, the biggest and the best. The pleasures of sin are genuine, but like a bait hides a hook, the consequences are always horrific. And the thing we need to understand is the reason we can't be strong is the power of temptation is not the thing out there that I'm stronger than. No, the thing out there is neutral. The power of temptation is the desire, the fallen desires, the self-centeredness that all of us are born with. Now, we have different things that stir up that temptation, but the problem is not the thing out there. The thing out there has never made me do something wrong. The thing out there has never made you make a bad choice. It's the desire within. You might write it down this way. Temptation is caused by the desires inside of me, not the thing outside of me. Temptation is caused by the desires within me, inside of me, not the thing outside of me. We've seen it before, but real quickly from the book of James. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by the enticing item. No. When they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And that's why the only path to victory, the only path to victory over greed, over pride, over sex, sexual temptation, over the desire to always be number one, all of those things that come from within, the only path to victory is that we flee. It's the only one. We'll never study the Bible enough. We'll never pray enough. We'll never be strong enough. And that's why the Bible commands us to flee. These verses are on your note sheet, so I'm just going to quote them quickly. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lust. And there he's not talking just about sexual temptation, but all of those things that are those appetites within. He says, don't try to fight them, flee them. When it comes to sexual sin, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee immorality. Not avoid it, run from that temptation. Matthew 5, 29 to 30, Jesus gets very graphic in what we're supposed to do with, now catch this, this is hyperbole, it's a metaphor, it's a word picture, but catch the power of it. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it's better that one of parts of your body perishes than your whole body is thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. For it's better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than your whole body be cast into hell. There's nothing there about praying more. There's nothing there about getting stronger. There's everything about accepting and understanding this incredibly important point that we have lost the moment we decide to resist instead of to flee. Now there's a third thing we see in this tragic story of David, and that is that cover-ups never cover up. Cover-ups never cover up. It reminds me of Proverbs 28, 13, written by David's son, Solomon, Whoever conceals their sins isn't going to prosper. The one who confesses and renounces them, they're the only one who's going to find mercy. David's desperate attempts to cover up his sin only made matters worse. Each attempt was more evil than the previous attempt. He brought Uriah home. Then he got him drunk. Then he had him killed. And then he shrugged off the death of other innocent soldiers as mere collateral damage. And outwardly, by the way, David seemed to be getting away with it. It's going to be right until Bathsheba uh, is going to bear this child that uh, suddenly uh, he is actually caught with it. So if you were on the outside and maybe David thinking, wow, I got rid of that one. But as I said, cover-ups never cover up. Because though outwardly David appeared as if everything was kind of okay, inwardly we know he was just being chewed up inside. If you read this week Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 51, Psalms that speak of this time in his life, David was just racked with guilt and anguish 
Oh, on the outside, whew, I got by with it. On the outside, maybe nobody knew, but on the inside, man, the stress and the stuff going on was incredible. And the truth is, our secrets never stay secret anyway. They always come out. That's what we, what we need to know ahead of time. You know, that situation, that thing you're going to do with somebody else, whether it's sexual or, or wrong in another area, you know, we've always got this idea, well, well, they will never tell. Yes, they will. There's always going to come a time where they tell someone. It just happens. The only way to keep a secret, I've told you before, is if one of us is dead. That's the only way. And secrets end up killing us in all kinds of ways. They kill us physically with that, uh, just that angst and all that and anguish that we're talking about. They also kill us spiritually because uh, inside we start just drying up. And they kill us emotionally. Because one of the things I, I've learned about uh, having a secret in, in our life is this. If, if there's a deep, dark secret in our life and people are loving us or kind to us or whatever, it's really hard to accept that love and affirmation because in the back of our head, we're always thinking, if you knew the full story, you wouldn't feel that way about me. If you really knew what I did then, if you really knew, that's why Satan is accuser of brethren. He loves to do that. And Jesus cries out, no, I paid for it on the cross. But it's, it's that covered up sin that we haven't renounced, we haven't confessed, we haven't done the right thing with that will just slowly, slowly eat us up. And here's the fourth principle regarding how the mighty fall. We will always, always harvest what we plant. It's an absolute law of the universe. What we harvest, a uh, plant rather, is what we're going to harvest. Don't be deceived. Let's take a look at what Galatians chapter 6, 7 and 8 says. Do not be deceived. Now last weekend we talked about this principle well, that whenever the Bible says do not be deceived, it means that most people don't understand this principle. Okay? So it's an important one that most of us don't really get down here. God cannot be mocked, flat out cannot be mocked. He knows, he sees, he's with us in everything we do. And a man is going to reap what he sows. So now he goes on to explain what that means. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction, always. What you put in the ground is always what's going to come up. Now, even though David will be forgiven, we're going to see that in the next chapter, he's going to have his life spared, as I said earlier. Uh, he's going to remain the king. The rest of his earthly life is nothing but a stinking Greek tragedy. And in a moment, I'll walk you through what actually happens to him. But here's the other side of it. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, the thing about the law of the harvest is this. When you plant something, you don't harvest it the next day. You know, we don't always get the positive rewards. In fact, it's eternal life that he talks about here. And we often don't get the negative right away, which is why we think, well, it's no big deal. Or we look at other people and say, hey, it's no big deal because the harvest hasn't come up yet. But you've planted the wrong thing. The wrong thing's going to come up, even in those situations where we are forgiven. If only David could have known what his attitude of privilege, his nurturing of his temptation, playing with fire, and his pursuit of fleeing, fleeting pleasure, sleeping with Bathsheba was going to bring upon him and his family. I want to tell you, he would not have been in an amorous mood. He would have fallen on the ground and groveled and vomited in horror had there been just some way to say, let me show you the rest of this story. Let me give you a spoiler alert of some of the things we're going to see. An unwanted pregnancy, the murder of a trusted friend, a dead baby, a daughter raped by a son, one son murdered by another son, a coup and a civil war led by one of your sons, a son who would publicly violate your wives on the palace rooftop as you had privately violated Uriah's wife. Can you imagine if suddenly all those things were in front of him? Oh my gosh. 
the temptation would not have seemed so pretty if somehow he could have only seen the hook and the bait. And why does God put a passage like this into our Bibles? Well, he puts it because he wants us to see and to know. The Bible doesn't cover it up. As I said at the beginning, God's the hero of the story, not David. He is one incredibly crooked stick. But we're told in Scripture, all of these things are here for rebuke, correction, instruction, and training in righteousness so that we will know what this path leads to. And we will not think that somehow we're smarter and we are better. If it could happen to David, it could happen to us. And when a seemingly godly person falls into one of those how in the world did that happen sins, we often think it happened suddenly. But it didn't. It's, it's like a tree that suddenly falls over. We look at it and go, wow, it just fell over in the wind. No, it didn't. The roots were rotting for decades. The roots were shallow for the entire time that tree was growing up. And that's why it seemed to suddenly fall. And that's exactly what happens in our life when we don't take care of the roots, when we resist instead of run, when we confuse our good luck and good fortune somehow as being wise and special. And when we think our past successes are somehow proof that we are different, completely privileged and invincible, capable of playing with fire when others can't play with it. If you're struggling with temptation today, I plead with you. Stop fighting and start running. Don't be a fool, even if so far you've been a lucky fool. Father, would you take these things and would you help us to see in our lives those areas where the enemies whisper is causing us not to listen to your shout. And Lord, speak to us where pride steps forward and causes us to think that somehow we're different when we aren't at all. For we know that when we take the path you call us to, not the path the world calls us to, that we end up in the place you're calling us to instead of the place the world is going to. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Our Lord who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, and who's given us the power to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us for today's message. As always, we want to encourage you to send your prayer request in. We love the opportunity to pray for you during the week. You can do that by sending it in via our connection form online, or you can text it to us using the number below. As always, thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. God bless.